Hello, everyone. Welcome to our shared devotionals on the seven last words of Jesus Christ. Our first reading comes from the Gospel of Luke. In Luke 23, 33 to 38, it reads, And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus' first words on the cross reflect the purpose for his ultimate sacrifice. It is a heartfelt prayer of intercession supported by his unselfish act on the cross. It addresses our greatest need, forgiveness. You see, many today make the mistake of thinking that much of what is happening is the result of man's reckless treatment of nature, pollution, overpopulation, and the depletion and misuse of natural resources. But the truth is, it's, it's actually deeper than that. I believe this virus is a result of our mistreatment, not of nature, but its creator. The fact that this is a worldwide pandemic is evidence of this. As many of us have seen, no one is exempt. Young or old, rich or poor, good or bad, no matter what ethnic background, every one of us are affected by this virus. So what is really happening? Well, the truth is, we cannot expect to keep ignoring, even rejecting the God who created and sustains the earth and think that everything will simply continue under our own conditions. Now, mind you, this is not God willing this to happen. It is God's immutable law in action. The Bible says what you sow, you will reap. You see, absent of God and his guidance in our lives, Jesus was right in saying, we don't know what we're doing. Isaiah 53, 6 confirms, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, Jesus gave his life on the cross so that he could offer forgiveness to all of us who respond to him in humility. The cross, my friend, is about forgiveness. Forgiveness for you and me. The restoration of our broken relationship with God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Now, how can we receive this forgiveness. First John 1 John 1.9 tells us, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's right. We just confess. We tell Him. We admit to Him our need. And receiving His complete forgiveness opens the door of grace that will bring healing in our lives. Now, we don't know when this virus will end or when this crisis will be over, but we, can't, we don't need to wait for this crisis to be over. We can actually have faith over fear when we receive the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. I pray that you will do so today. Thank you, and God bless you. Right after the declaration of forgiveness, which is the first word of our Lord, Someone may ask, how can God forgive someone who do not know what they're doing? Well, the answer is found on the second word. Remember the thief on the cross when he begged Jesus and he humbled himself before our Lord? He said, Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom. And Jesus answered, and he said, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. In other words, there are three responses that the Lord Jesus uh, addressed to his word. Number one is the positive response. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, or I assure you, that's an assurance. Of, of, 
of the forgiveness. And second one is the urgent response today, not tomorrow, not I'll think it over today. I assure you today. And the third response is glorious. Today you will be with me. It means you, we will all be with the Lord. We don't need to die to be with him. We can start tonight. He said, I assure you, today you will be with me. The best part of that promise is that we will all be in paradise. So if we have Christ in our life, that's an assurance that we will all go to heaven. But let me ask you this question. God forbid, if your life ends tonight, are you sure you're going to heaven? If that question still question behind your mind, well, we have the answer. We just need to humble ourselves in sincere prayer of repentance. You may follow. I'd like to invite you all to pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I humble myself before you to ask you to forgive all my sins. Thank you, Lord, for dying on that cross of Calvary. And thank you, Lord, that my sins will be forgiven. Thank you, Lord, that you can be the Lord of my life. So, Lord, I'd like to surrender everything to you. Take over my life. Be my Lord, Lord God. And thank you for being my Savior. God, I want to be a participant in building up your kingdom. So, Lord, tonight, take control over my life. Thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. Thank you for the peace that transcends all understanding. Thank you, God, for being with me. In Jesus' name, amen. Isn't he great? Yes. <laughs> Amen. I have special favoritism towards him. He's my god brother. <laughs> but that song just brings about, you know, a great lead into this word, this third word. Excuse me. So it says that as he's hanging from that cross, it says that he said, Woman, behold your son. And then to John, Behold your mother. For those of you who are a part of my congregation, you know that I like to tell stories. So if you would please humor me. Picture this. So Mary is older now. The years have passed. He's, she's no longer that teenager who had this son, this son through the Immaculate Conception. She's probably got gray hair. She's alone, she's older, and as we can see, she's watching her firstborn son get tortured, sadly. So she's standing at the cross and she's with these two other women and with John the Apostle, the beloved of Christ, and as she's watching this going on, she hears from the cross that her son is willing to take care of her, even in his agony. This was his last will and testament. He is a shell of a man, and he is saying, I know I can't take care of you anymore. I'm leaving you, and I'm not going to be able to take care of you after this. So I'm giving you into the care of one of my beloved. Take, take care of her after I'm gone. Do what I would do for her. We all know that it says in Scripture, honor your father and your mother that your days will be long, right? And you will have a good life. Amen. So it's amazing to me that Jesus hanging on that cross, waiting to be executed, can still take the time to honor and to love his mother. Because he can't say, Mom, when I get off this cross, we'll go on vacation. Mom, in a week or two, we'll take that trip you wanted. It's not going to happen. Right? Yes. You want to know what the truth is here? Although Jesus was about the business of saving the world, he was not too busy to think about his parents. Mm. Again, here's some applications tonight. 
I know that there are some of you who are note takers, so feel free to take this time. Number one, no one is ever discharged from that sacred obligation. Our Lord has left a pattern for us to see that even though we are in the business of ministering to others, we must be committed to taking care of not just our physical parents. I know some of us, you know, they're no longer with us. But find some spiritual parents in your life. Mm. People who can mentor you, who can raise you up. Mm. Number two, when you can't do anything else for the people around you, just tell them I love you. Mm. That's what Jesus did. He was selfless enough through all that blood, through all that gore, to say, Mom, I love you so much that I want you to still be taken care of. Mm. Amazing, huh? Mm. How many times do we, from the perspective of kids, how many times do we feel that we don't have enough time mm. to spend? And yet, he really was running out of time, and he still fulfilled the obligation. And finally, no matter what you do in this life, you can hardly be considered a success if in your climb to success, you forget to honor your father and your mother, Amen. that your days will be long. Amen. So if you didn't, if you've heard anything from all that I've said and all that I've shared with you, no matter what else we do in this life, church, we can hardly be considered a success if we do not remember our parents the way that Jesus remembered them. Mm. Honor your father and mother. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. For, for parents, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart. Yes. So true in my life. Amen. Now you're probably saying, how do I put this to action? This is mine. Don't worry. Come into a close. So if we want to take this to heart, and your parents are still around, just spend time with them. Go to them. Tell them that you love them. Make a phone call. Write a note. Say I love you. I know many of us have different personalities in my house alone. I'm the touchy-feely one. My little sister, She's not with us tonight. She expresses her love in different ways. But the important thing is that we need to express our love no matter what. Number two, if you can't honor them when they're alive, always remember them, the legacy that they've given you. And live your lives as they've taught you. And finally, if we're not in good terms with our parents' people, we can honor them by refusing to speak no ill of them. Amen. We may not have had a mother like Mary, oh, praise God for her, or a father like Joseph. Maybe things in your life are not going the way you'd like it to. And you're saying, I'm just accepting the hand that was dealt. Church, no. Let us be people of love. Let's pray. Father, you have paid in full the price for us. As the first and the second word were given, Lord, I'm reminded of your selfless act. You could have said, I'm in too much pain to care. I'm in too much pain to care about my mom, much less anybody else. But Lord, in your great love and sacrifice, you're emptying, Father. You took the time yes. to even do something that many of us take for granted. Mom, here's someone who's going to take care of you. May we honor those that are older in the faith, stronger, Lord. May we learn from each other, God. Mm. And may we continue to strive for that selfless, perfect, steadfast love. We thank you, Lord. It's in your son's precious name. Amen. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? 
The fourth word of Jesus on the cross reminds me of other times when the Son of Man cried. He sighed over Jerusalem's hard-heartedness and unbelief in him, Matthew 23. He wept at the death of his friend Lazarus, John 11. Then on the cross he cried two times. Why Jesus cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, was not explained by the Gospel writer Matthew. But being forsaken by his father, there was no doubt about it. Why would the Son of the Almighty God, the one who was tempted in every way as we are but never sinned, now hang on the cross only intended to execute the worst criminals in those days? However, the scripture was clear why the Son of God hung on the cross forsaken by his heavenly Father. First, Jesus became sin for us that we may be made without sin. Second, Jesus was condemned on our behalf that we may be freed from our guilt. Consequently, Jesus was punished for our sins that we may be saved from our own punishment. Jesus died on the cross that we may be made alive forevermore. Long before our Savior suffered on the cross, the prophet Isaiah declared, Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Isaiah 53 Today, Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. A song by Gordon Jensen reflects the reasons why the Son of Man was forsaken by his heavenly Father. It says, I was guilty with nothing to say, and they were coming to take me away. But then a voice from heaven was heard that said, Let him go, take me instead the crown of thorns and the spear in his side, and all the pain should have been mine. Those rusty nails were meant for me, yet Jesus took me and let me go free. I should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on the cross in disgrace, but Jesus, God's Son, took my place. When the Son of Man took the place of punishment for our sins, and the Holy God released his wrath against our sins, which Jesus carried. God forsook sin against the human form of his only Son. Thus Jesus on the cross can't help but cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Hi, I'm Pastor Jun. I would like to share with you my reflections on the fifth saying of Jesus, I am thirsty. In John chapter 19, verse 28, it says, Later knowing that everyone had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. These words of Jesus, I am thirsty, remind us of the profound power and wisdom of God as demonstrated in this seemingly lame and foolish act of Jesus Christ on the cross. To the Jews, the crucified Christ is a stumbling block. It is not a sign of power, but it is a sign of weakness. And to the Greeks, for God to suffer in the hands of mortal men and women is not wise at all, but utter foolishness. However, for us who believe and agree in the power and wisdom of God in Jesus Christ, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And with this, I would like to share with you my three reflections. First, by saying, I am thirsty, Jesus reveals the truth in his person. Being the Son of God in blood and in flesh, Jesus is able to empathize in our human weaknesses and our failings, and also sympathize in our desperate desire to be delivered from the power of sin and death. Second, by saying, I am thirsty, Jesus confirms the truth. God's word 
is literally being fulfilled even in the pain and the suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. In Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5 it says, But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, and the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Lastly, by saying, I am thirsty, Jesus offers life to those who thirst for him. Jesus did not say, I am thirsty, to extend his life here on earth. In fact, when he said that, he was literally submitting himself to the power and the will of his Father, even to die on the cross. Man is always thirsting for things that last, which only God can offer. St. Augustine says, our hearts is restless until it rests in you. In the same vein, the writer of Psalms in 42 verse 1, As the deer pants for the water, so my soul pants for you. In God's power and wisdom, He shows to us how Jesus thirsts for our humility. So we will surrender our all to Him as the way, as the truth, and as the life. So that we will love our God with everything that we have and love our neighbors as ourselves. Thank you for joining us in this time of celebration and reflection as we look back on the seven last words of the Lord Jesus Christ that uh, He said as a fulfillment of His mission and also a fulfillment of uh, His plan for the world. It is so meaningful that we are doing this in this way so that uh, we can reach to you and reach out many people at this uh, at least very unusual time. Brothers and sisters, the sixth word, it is finished. Let me give you the full context, the whole verse or passage of this particular word so that we can at least better understand what it meant and what the Lord would like us to understand. The passage is found in John chapter 19, says, a jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put a sponge on a stalk of a hyssop plant, and lifted up to Jesus' lips. When he had received a drink, he said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And let me offer this reflection so that at least uh, we will see uh, as God has been leading us, uh, we'll see what God would like us to understand. Probably the Lord has a different insight or a special insight to you at this time. By the way, the provision of vinegar was believed to be both a sign of mockery and it's also a way of inducing further pain. Uh, as Jesus was at the point of his death, ready and willing to give up his spirit, his all, he was given that particular wine vinegar drink. It was not meant to relieve his pain. It was not meant to give to quench his thirst, but it was meant to increase more pain. It is a way of prolonging the consciousness of crucifixion, the consciousness of shame and pain. It's the ultimate mockery of the Savior, which was intended to suffer more. It's, uh, what's the me what is the meaning of this uh, act that the Roman soldier did to Jesus? Uh, biblically, it was a fulfillment of what has been prophesied long, long time ago. In uh, Psalms chapter 69, it said, They gave me also gold for my meat, 
and my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. This is what was prophesied in the book of Psalms. And now at this moment, at that point in time, when he was offered that wine vinegar, it was a fulfillment. In the same extent, in the same manner, I would like to encourage you that this particular act, this word, it is finished, means that God came true. He fulfilled the prophecy. He did what was said long time ago. So if what was said long time ago happened and was fulfilled by Jesus himself, it is also logical to think that His promises will also be fulfilled. The word, it is finished, means God came true. It is a promise of the fulfillment of God's prophetic announcement. Now, it is finished also means it is the beginning of a new dawn. The beginning of a new season. It is interesting that our conventional thought that the meaning of this word is the end. It is finished. It is done. It's the end. But lo and behold, such word, it is finished, was actually the beginning of a new age, a new dawn, a new season, the season of God. It is finished is telling us that aside from the fulfillment of the prophecy long time ago, it is also important to consider that it means now it is the time of the reign of God's people. The time where God will always be with us through the Holy Spirit. It is the time when we as people and He as God will always be with us and we will be doing what God would like us and intend us to do. My friends, brothers and sisters, the atoning work of God, the completion of God's atoning work was done. It is now time for us to consider and also think that since His atoning work was done, what will be next? When Jesus said, it is finished, the next is the beginning of something new. Yes, physically at that time, Jesus said, and it means for His body, it is finished. But for us, as His body, those of us who believe in the Lord, it is the beginning of a new thing. Remember this, my brothers and sisters. Whenever we are reading this word or considering or thinking about this word, it is finished. Number one, it means God came true. And God will always fulfill His promise. Secondly, God is inviting us since He has done the atoning work, He is inviting us the new season, the season of God. It is finished. God fulfilled His mission, His work. It is now our beginning, the beginning of a new work. I hope you will always think about this because God would like us to engage with Him in the beginning of a new season, the season of God and the season of His people. Thank you very much. May the Lord bless you. Hello everyone, my name is Pastor Manny Selva Cruz. I'm the pastor of LA First Church of the Nazarene. And today we're going to talk about the last word, the seventh word of Christ at the cross when He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. There are three important words that we could learn from this verse. First, relationship. Second, trust. And third, is commitment. First, 
relationship. There is a relationship between God, Jesus, and God. He calls God as His Father. And Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. There is closeness, there is unity, there is love, there is harmony between the two. You see, we have relationship with our family members, the father, the wife, the children. That relationship is important. We need to build this relationship. But we need to build a relationship with God, which is more important. When you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have a personal relationship with God. And then you could call God as your Heavenly Father. Because through Jesus, we have been adopted into His family. And second, because we are in the family, we learn how to trust one another. God trusts you, and you must learn to trust God completely. Without trust, there is no real relationship. To trust means to put your confidence on God, to put your belief on Him, to put your faith upon Him. So the question that we need to ask ourselves is, do you trust Him completely? You see, Christ is trusting God, the Father, His future, the immortal part of Him, His soul and spirit. He knew that He is safe in the hands of the Father. When He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit unto you, He uses the word commit. It means to pledge His soul, to face His death with full assurance of faith, to dedicate His future, to give totally everything to God, His Father. And this is what Jesus is teaching us in this moment as we meditate upon this seventh word. We must learn to commit our lives to Him totally, especially during this time of this global pandemic called the coronavirus. You see, many people are fearful, they're anxious, they're worried of their health, worried of their loved ones, worried about the economy. We are in deep danger every single day because of this invisible enemy that lurks everywhere we go. You see, we have no control of the virus. We have no control of the pandemic. And that is why we need to learn to trust Jesus, trust God by committing our lives to Him, committing our faith, our health unto Him, committing our families' health to God, committing our future, our careers, or the economy of our country to the Lord. We must learn to trust Him completely. When he said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. You see, the more we commit to God, the more it builds strength. The more it builds relationship, the more it builds trust and confidence. Commitment shields us from the enemy's attack. Commitment to God assures us that our future is good. Have you committed your life to Christ? Now is the acceptable time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. May the Lord Jesus Christ bring life and encouragement to our beings. Amen.